Well, good evening. Can everyone hear me all right? Yes. We do have a little audio thing here, too, that we can use, but uh, we're also streaming this on Facebook, so sorry about that. Just trying to get technology working on both sides of in-person and virtual. And uh, it looks like one of our panel discussions is maybe a little bit late, so I'm going to try to stall a little bit here. But thank you all for coming. Um, we are live on Facebook, just so you all know. Uh, one announcement before we get started, uh, to hold the date on your calendar. Um, on February 23rd, 2023, um, at 6 p.m. here at the center, um, and also on Facebook Live, we will have uh, our next program in our speaker series with Carolyn Janey. Uh, the UVA history professor and director of the Noss Center for Civil War History will discuss her new book, A History of the Weeks and Months um, after, the, after Appomattox, called Ends of War, The Unfinished Fight of Lee's Army After Appomattox. So you won't want to miss that talk. Um, for our Facebook audience, and we're up on Facebook? Yep. Cool. Um, it will be posted in the comments section, and for those of here tonight, you can find in our recent newsletter um, the information for that event, um, and also a bunch of other information. Uh, for those on Facebook, we'll provide a link to our website homepage uh, so you can find our most recent newsletter. So thank you for joining us tonight here at the center and online. Uh, my name is Tom Chapman, Executive Director of the Albemarle Charlottesville Historical Society. Uh, for our program tonight, we refer to this as our annual meeting, uh, membership meeting, because that's what historical societies do. Um, we have a January meeting. The first meeting of the year, we gather together to review the important um, work completed in the previous year and put on a great program to kick off the next year um, and set the tone and theme for what the Historical Society will accomplish in the upcoming year. For what we have accomplished, I'll point out to the newsletter um, I've mentioned already. You can read in detail about what your Historical Society has been doing, putting our vision and mission into practice, uh, reinventing and reimagining the Historical Society for the 21st century as a strong, civic-minded, organization that promotes an inclusive local history where everyone has a story to tell. We were able in 2022 to get back to what a historical society is known for, in-person gatherings and events, and bringing our local history collections to the public. Uh, an example would be our Francis Brand reopening the, reopening the gallery exhibit that we had here at the Center at Belvedere this past summer. Um, we're so thankful for the Center and these great um, facilities for our partnership this year, not only with the exhibit, but with programs like tonight um, and additional opportunities that we'll have in the upcoming year. Um, one quick question I'm curious about is, for those attending here in person, how many here are at the center for the first time? So we will duly note this for Carolyn Merrick and the others here at the center. Um, thanks for the opportunity to bring a new, new person here for, for them to, to see this great facility. Um, in 2022, 2022, we are taking all of our programs like this one and continuing to offer them online while also bringing us together in person, connecting with as many, possible, um, many people as possible. And for those out on Facebook, um, if maybe you can add in the comments uh, where you are joining us from tonight. Um, are you local? Um, who can take the prize for the attendee who has joined us from the farthest away? I'd be interested in seeing. Um, I did see somebody who uh, registered to come here in attendance, but I know they live in Chicago, so I think they might have got Facebook and uh, the center RSVP mixed up. So a few highlights from 2022. Um, our big idea in 2022 is an oral history project focused on race and sports that's caught the attention of both the local and the national community. We've raised over $150,000 to bring the voices of local students who live through desegregation into our history to tell their stories. Uh, the Virginia Humanities, Perry Foundation, the NEH, American Historical Association, just a few of the organizations that supported this work and with nearly 40 interviews completed, we are very close to unveiling our new website in the next few months, and that will bring these important stories to the general public. 
And we're not stopping with that, but looking for additional grants to continue that work and expand the reach of the oral history website to include K through 12 educational materials and uh, the work that Annie Evans um, will help us with, hopefully. <coughs> Penn Park is another project that we've been working on through our partnership with the city of Charlottesville. We're civically engaged, working to research and understand and give voice to the descendants of the enslaved buried in the unmarked and unknown burials at Penn Park. Through a better understanding of our shared history, a shared hard history, we can fully embrace what happened in our past to look forward to find repair. Hatton Ferry, we saved it. Um, now comes the hard work of working to preserve it. Um, the ferry ran in 2022. Uh, it will run again in 2023. And we'll be coming out with some news soon about a generous donation that will endow and sustain Hatton Ferry into the future. So some great progress there. In 2022, we welcome Phyllis Leffler as our new president of the Board of Directors. Uh, she was not able to be with us tonight, but I want to thank her for her leadership, guidance, her volunteer spirit with her work and that of George Gillum, our race and sports oral history project would never have happened. Um, and I want to shout out to George if he's watching on Facebook. I hope he uh, feels better. He took a, a fall a few days ago and is home uh, making himself feel better. So uh, get better, George. We miss you. I also want to recognize Shelly Murphy, our past president, um, is still a member of our board. Uh, she gave me the opportunity to be here in this position uh, to sustain, while well, she was sustaining the historical society through some difficult times to get us where we are today. Um, and I ask you all to check out her daily progress article uh, to learn more about this remarkable woman. Um, one of the daily progress is Distinguished Dozen for 2022. And we have a couple other board members, and if you don't mind, I'll point you out. We have Dan Smythe, who is our treasurer, um, Punky, who is a member of our board, and Kay Slaughter, I believe I saw. And did I miss anyone else? Um, we'll point out Mike Dickens, but he hasn't been voted on yet. Thank you very much, <laughs> Mike. So Mike Dickens will actually also be joining us in January with our um, next meeting. Um, and I'd also be remiss if I didn't also thank Loren Lorenzo Dickerson, who was here a little bit earlier. He is focused very much on our race and sports oral history project. Um, has been, um, his work has guided us with his local knowledge, his eye for filmmaking. Um, the quality of his videography matched with his insight as a local storyteller has really shaped that project um, and also the upcoming website. And every other project we have had success with in 2022, from Hatton Ferry to our Francis Brand exhibit here at the center, our Renaissance School exhibit <coughs> at the Historical Society, social media, the exploration of Penn Park, um, and even taking out his time of his busy schedule to drag his kids out here tonight to make sure we got this hybrid program right. <laughs> and of course, your Historical Society would not exist without you, its members. Uh, membership is what sustains us, so thank you all for coming out tonight. I could go on with the many accomplishments, and I know I've not mentioned many other people who have had an impact, uh, but you know who you are, and I thank you. Um, during my first full year as the executive director, we had Professor Ed Ayers uh, for our January 2021 program. That historian from UVA, past president of the University of Richmond, now a colleague with Annie, um, our moderator tonight. In his 2021 program, he explored the importance of local history, of understanding how everything we view as history must take into account what impacts us on a local level. Some noteworthy comments from his talk, and I paraphrase, we have just begun to explore the past. We have just begun to learn all of the complexities. Call it revising history, but revising history with truth, research, patience with devotion. I, meaning Ed Ayers, have spent my life trying to show people that no, we do not already know what happened, and that's a good thing, because we can find out. People can tell us there is always more to learn. History is not a closed book. For the historical society, everyone has a story to tell. In January 22, uh, we had Gail Jessup White for our membership program. Monticello's first public relations and community engagement officer, the first descendant of Thomas Jefferson in the slave community to be employed by the Thomas Jefferson Foundation, 
an award-winning journalist and one of, the, one of our newest board members, Gail discussed the journey to reclaim her heritage, to understand a past was not told in the history books, her personal yet also nationally important story. As Ed, Ed Ayers told us, history is not a closed book. Um, and for us, everyone has a story to tell. So tonight, for our January 2023 membership meeting, we have a panel discussion, a great program that helps us connect with our youth, the next generation who will guide us. And as we look to 2023, our focus will be bringing on youth more into the work that we're doing, that every local student has a story to learn about our local history, one that cannot be found sometimes in the history books, the hard histories that must be told to help us understand where we have come from and shape where we are going. And who has that knowledge and responsibility for our school youth? Well, our local teachers, our panel members tonight, um, who teach history in historic times. So a, a few housekeeping items. Um, we welcome all everyone out on Facebook. Uh, if you have any comments or questions, please put them in the comments section. Uh, we'll be addressing a, a question and answer period at the end of the panel discussion. And if you, anyone in attendance here has questions, we can do that at the end of the panel discussion. Um, so let's get this program started. Um, introduce you to Annie Evans. Um, Annie is the Director of Education and Outreach for New American History at the University of Richmond. Annie is a National Geographic Society Gros, Grosvenor? Grosvenor. Grosvenor. Oh, they put an S in there? <laughs> ah, they, mm, should have practiced that one. Teacher Fellow, uh, Nat Geo Certified Educator and Trainer, and Co-Coordinator of the Virginia Geographic Alliance. With over 30 years of classroom and educational experience, um, and leadership. She designs curricula and facilitates professional learning through, for K through 16 teachers and museum educators, focusing on historical thinking skills, geo-literacy, instructional coaching, project-based learning, and performance assessments. New American History is led by Dr. Ed Ayers with generous support from the University of Richmond. And I do believe Annie just keeps the, the wheels turning on that bus constantly. So. Thank you, Annie, for joining us, and I will let you introduce the other panel members. Thank you, and Sterling, and everyone for coming out tonight. Um, I am especially excited to get to be here with um, colleagues and friends. I actually know each of these people before tonight, so that made it a lot easier. Um, so I'm going to start over here with uh, Sally Duncan. Sally's a history teacher at the Renaissance School. She teaches women's history, U.S. history through the local lens. Uh, and also serves on the Charlottesville Historical Resources Committee. She graduated from UVA in 2020 with her BA in American Studies. She'll receive her master's degree from UVA in American Religion this spring. She's also interested in uh, the way that race operates in cultural spaces, and her current research is on evangelical pop culture and whiteness. Um, I was fortunate to attend an exhibit at the Historical Society where Sally and her beautiful students were presenting some work that they had done um, on the left is my friend and uh, previous colleague when I was in the Charlottesville City Schools for about a decade I was the history coordinator and I got to work with Matt on a daily basis. Uh, Matt Deegan has taught world history and U.S. history at Charlottesville High School right here in, in town um, since 2013. And during that time there his students have taken part in a remarkable, I'm adding now to your bio, a remarkable, I'm putting that word in, uh, Veterans History Project the Untold and the Untold Story Project. Both have asked his students to conduct their own authentic research, interviewing veterans from the local uh, area and local history makers from various marginalized groups. They've created videos, they've made podcasts to tell these stories. And Matt's professional learning experiences took him anywhere from the war bunkers in France to um, part of a writing project on World War I, uh, producing a teaching guide for the American Battle Monuments Commission. They've also taken him into the living rooms of the local Vietnam veterans to capture those oral histories as part of a Library of Congress project. Um, and Matt added that as Henry Ford once said, anyone who keeps learning stays young. Um, we are still hoping our friend Hashim Davis um, from Albemarle County Schools will join us. Uh, Hashim is a native of Brooklyn, New York, and a high school history teacher at Albemarle High School. The subjects that he teaches include AP US History, African American Studies, and an advanced section of Virginia US History, Holocaust and Genocide, and uh, Government. And he received his undergrad degree um, 
in history and political science. Uh, his master's uh, in secondary history from the University of Mary Washington, and he's also worked with the United States Holocaust Museum as a teaching fellow there. So um, we're hoping that she will be able to join us shortly. But I'm going to go ahead and get the panel discussion kicked off. Uh, and the first question is going to go to both Matt and Sally, so I'll let them decide who wants to jump in first. But um, I thought it would be good to sort of frame this um, for them to begin describing the way that local history, specifically using oral history, since both of them mentioned that in their bio, um, as an integral part of their history instruction. So who wants to start with that one? I'll start. Um, why should students study history, I think, is, is, is a good question to start with. And I teach teenagers, um, many of whom need that question answered uh, like genuinely like we're, we're not just reading textbooks we're not just kind of looking at um, slideshows like why is this an important subject for my time so I think local history is a way to answer that question that brings relevance immediately to the lives of students um, by studying local history, you're studying the same streets and sidewalks that they walk on. Uh, you're studying, in some cases, maybe like family members or uh, relatives. Uh, so local history has a, has a relevance that just makes historical concepts immediately come alive for students. Um, and specifically with oral histories, they allow uh, personalization, they allow students to hear a story and then you can connect that story to the larger theme of war if it's a military veteran or when you hear the story of um, a student who was in a segregated school uh, like Burley High School that the, the facts and the the larger narratives can be attached to that in a way that students are engaged by so I think um, local history is a way to engage students who might be reluctant to learn history because they've seen it as memorizing facts and dates and the names of battles. And we should know facts, of course, but I think the stories make it come alive for them. Thanks, Matt. Sally, do you want to add to that? Yeah. Um, uh, I think you know when you're trying to center the experiences of the people whose stories haven't been traditionally told that oral history is um, really important. Um, and so I start off my class with this video um, by this amazing Monacan historian, Dr. Um, Karen Wood, and she gives um, the history of the Monacan people. Um, and so I think one of the valuable things about oral history is it, you know, makes clear to the students that like, you know, these people haven't disappeared and like, you know, that their history and their stories matter. Um, and then when you pair it with kind of more traditional other local history things, um, one of my favorite super in the weeds thing I discovered when doing history to put together the local history class is in the late 70s, VDOT made this whole history of Albemarle County roads and it's like this 300 page PDF. It's, they transcribed all of the old road orders and like who built the roads and when and like which landowner was responsible. Um, and the the basic road structure of the county that's like still the spine of the roads that we drive on today were laid down between 1725 and 1750 um, and then you pair this with the monacan history and they were still here interacting with settlers until like 1730 and so when you're teaching something super big and abstract like you know settler colonialism that was like hard to wrap your head around you can see like the nuts and bolts of like how this really happened here and like you know what that looked like and like how closely like road building was to like the Monacan people leaving and you know the settlers didn't come to empty land um, and what was really great for the students is that in the VDOT report the author actually says that the land was empty and that the you know Indians had been gone for a very long time and all that kind of stuff and that they didn't have a role in you know creating the roads or anything like that but when you like listen to them tell their stories and like learn the Monacan history, you know you know that that's not true. Like they were trading with people in Michigan and like you know down with like um, you know along the Atlantic Ocean, 
And so it's a really good lesson for students to learn that like written history can be wrong and that oral history can correct it, we can learn from it and kind of fill in our gaps. And so trying to replicate that sort of really cool experience of combining histories is something that I keep trying to replicate. Mm. Great example. All right, Matt, this one's all for you. I know that you've explored the value of oral histories very extensively in your classroom uh, with your Veterans Project and others. How has this work made you think differently about your own teaching practice um, or about our community? And how would you like to expand that work as you continue on? Yeah, so the, the Veterans History Project was something that I um, kind of stumbled on. Um, my mother is actually in the audience. Um, she, she likes to cut out articles and give them to me to read that are interesting, <laughs> that she finds interesting. And I remember I was, I was home uh, one um, winter break and she had this article um, of a New Jersey teacher, originally from New Jersey, and um, it, was, it was the Veterans History Project. He was um, connecting with local veteran groups and having his students um, sit down and interview them and then build uh, narratives, their own narratives, based on like the raw footage from the, those conversations. And I was still a young teacher kind of trying to figure it out. And um, that project seemed really appealing to me. And um, I pursued it further. I especially partnered with uh, the American Legion Post in Keswick. And, um, and there was also a really amazing museum in Rutgersville um, that unfortunately closed down, but it was um, a museum that was built by a Vietnam veteran, and he built it from the ground up. It was a very organic museum. He, he traveled to Vietnam and uh, put artifacts in it and invited other local Vietnam veterans to be the tour guides. Um, so it wasn't um, institutionalized, it was very personal, and the, the guys would post there. Um, uniforms and photos that they had collected um, and so this veterans project kind of came together um, just in meeting those veterans and uh, connecting my students to them by going out to the museum and then we would have the interviews there after we saw the exhibit um, so it was it was it was special and that experience has made me see in terms of local history and oral histories, how we need to expand the classroom beyond the, the walls, right? To include community groups who um, have an educational component or who, who want to connect with teenagers and tell their stories, but really don't ha have an access point. They don't know how to do it. Um, so um, it made me see how eager community groups are for this type of, of work. Um, and it also made me see, because students are crafting the questions, they are the ones who are leading the interview, recording it, and then coming back and going through the, the raw footage, and they're the driver in that narrative. They're crafting that narrative, they're doing the background research as well, and how um, students really took ownership over that. And it reminded me how important it is for students to take ownership over um, a project like that. So. And that's being too humble because uh, the Virginia Film Festival put together a, a presentation and we invited school divisions from all over the region um, when Ken Burns had the Vietnam series on PBS. Do you remember this? You might even remember. You've done so many things. And the students were able to invite some of the veterans they had interviewed for Matt's project in and we did a screening of the first episode of the Ken Burns series. And Terry Allard from, um, a lot of you know Terry, she's on our local VPM station. She came and moderated the discussion and Matt's students got to see their work amplified on a much wider scale as part of the Virginia Film Festival. So your mom's here, you don't have to be so humble. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna brag on him for you, mom. Um, and my mother also cut out articles and I loved it, so. <laughs> All right, Sally, so last year, this is kind of how I met you. Um, last year, you and your students recently participated in an exhibit that Tom and Sterling put together, um, an educational look at childhood in Charlottesville. Uh, at, and 
Can you talk to us a little bit about that experience, how that shaped and changed your students' perceptions of learning history and maybe informed your own teaching practice? Yeah, um, so I think like the first time you walk into an archive, it is just like the coolest experience to just realize that there's like all this history sitting there. Um, and so the first time that the students like went upstairs in the historical society and there's just, there's so much stuff up there. Um, but that was really cool and watching them go into the library and just see how many books there are. Um, you know, people are in there researching and stuff. Like that was really cool and to like watch them get that experience. Um, it was really fun. Um, and so they each picked out um, an object from the collection that they had sort of pulled that was about childhood stuff. Um, and then they each did research on that object to try and figure out, you know, what it was and kind of the larger context of it. Um, and I think, you know, they learned that like physical, tangible items from everyday life can really help you understand who people were and what they valued and um, you know, even just looking at like a high school handbook or a textbook actually like when you like dug into it actually gives you a lot of insight into like just, you know what people were like um, and so I think that was really good for them and then it was also a good lesson in you know doing local history that you are like handling people's stories um, and you know they might be around their descendants might be around and so how you know handling stories with care um, there was one example where a student had um, researched a person and was telling their story but it wasn't completely positive and so you know how do you like tell the truth but do it in a way that's respectful and like thinking about you know if their grandchildren walked in here and read this, what would, you know, how would you want them to feel? Um, and so I think that was a really important lesson for them. Um, and for me, it really kind of reaffirmed my understanding of like how important local history is and using the work of local historians, because there's so many here. Like, I think we probably have a much larger pool of local history than like a lot of communities. And so it, you know, feels like a shame to not use it. Um, we use the documentary of the Blue Ridge Tunnel that was just made a couple of years ago. Um, and it's really cool because it's a fascinating documentary, but also it's something that the students can go and visit and like really appreciate now the work that went into it. Um, but I pair it with, you know, national stories of immigration and, you know, how the Irish were treated and stereotypes and stuff, um, which is also sort of like this big thing to understand, especially trying to like imagine like Irish people being, you know, people being mean to them and stuff um, and you watch the documentary and there's this really great story of how the railroad company brought in enslaved people to break labor strikes of the Irish um, but then it turns out that enslaved people are actually more expensive because when they died they had to pay but like if Irish people died you just brought in more Irish people um, and so kind of pairing that really helped students like think through these really big ideas of like race and class and immigration and all that stuff and so you know local history I keep finding just really grounds these bigger stories and helps it feel real and helps it um, helps the students really understand like what we're talking about and in my head I'm thinking I don't know where Lorenzo went. I know he was here earlier. Lorenzo's film that he made last year about Vinegar Hill and the Irish. You know, yeah. you, you, in the beginning of that film, they talk about that whole connection to Irish immigrants and how Vinegar Hill got its name. And there's all these different versions of that story. So that kind of brings that other piece into it. Um, if you haven't seen Lorenzo's film Raised, it's excellent. Yeah, he actually has um, like two or three. He's got one on the sports, history of sports. And it's, and yeah, and watching, because we, we also watched all of those in the progression of like his filmmaking mm -hmm. is also really cool to watch, but also shows the students that like you can just like do history and it doesn't have to be yep. like amazing when you And this start. is your neighbor, right? You right, see at the grocery yeah. store, you see him on the right, ball field. Yeah. Oh, there's Lorenzo. I saw your movie. Um, yeah. So I'm going to quick follow up. Um, in introducing those oral history interviews to your students, what impact or how have you seen their response change over this period of time where you've been slowly folding this local history in and these oral histories? Yeah. So we did um, the Race and Sports Project um, 
of the historical society is working on um, my students got a chance to read or to watch some of the interviews um, and read some of the transcripts and I wanted to see I think it's like rare where you just are faced with a brand new story that you don't have any context with and so I just gave it to them cold so we're not like you know it's about the 1950s and we just finished the Civil War um, and so they each just got someone's oral history and I want to see like you know what can you learn from a story when you might not have like the wider context you know some of them didn't know what massive resistance was and that kind of thing um, and then I also had them annotate the interviews and so people would mention stuff like Buddy's restaurant or Bobby Kennedy and stuff and so I was like look up what these things are to like fill out the interview and so you can learn more um, and so all of that part was sort of rough <laughs> But by the end, they all did a presentation on their person, and it was really great. Some of them like went and looked up yearbooks online about their people and did all this outside research. Um, one student did a mini presentation on massive resistance within his um, presentation. Um, so that was really cool, and they, I think they really valued like hearing all these stories. Um, for me, I learned that like context is actually really important, um, and so I wish I would have like kind of framed it better. Um, but you know, when we get to the 1950s in a couple months, they will have like you know this really cool local understanding of you know what this national story is. Hmm. All right, so this question goes to both of you. So again, I'll let you pick who wants to respond first, but. Um, as all of us here know, in the last 24 months, um, librarians and teachers, particularly history teachers, have kind of been under a microscope. Um, there are some who have said that schools are teaching something called CRT, or we've heard things in the news that um, they think some educators are indoctrinating their children. Um, there's you know, kind of this history culture war going on. It's part of a much larger national dialogue, but it's certainly been very prevalent here in Virginia. Um, so what has been the response uh, to, that, to the current discussion that's been in the news a lot in the last few months um, about Virginia's standards of learning, which are constantly under review every seven years here in Virginia by state law. We are in the middle of that cycle now as teachers. Um, have you found yourselves self-editing things that you say or that you teach, teaching it differently? Um, do you feel like you have to hold back and not talk about certain topics even though they are in the curriculum at the local level? Are you avoiding any discussions in class? Uh, has the political climate in any way changed your teaching practices as this debate has garnered more and more attention? Give a, give a one word answer. <laughs> <laughs> that's all. That's all. That's that's my answer will probably be shorter. I'm first. I, I'll start. And admittedly, I haven't followed the the political blow by blow of the um, the standards as they're being revised. You know, there's a. I think there might be a meeting tomorrow about this. The standards at the state level. Um, it, it's gone through some different drafts. Um, I, I will say that. It's unfortunate that the history classroom has been pulled into the cultural wars that are a part of the larger public square conversation. Um, and I think that, um, yeah, it's just, it, it's unfortunate. Um, I am very fortunate at Charlottesville City Schools where I don't feel like I need to revise what I've already been doing, and that is teaching an honest history, teaching the truth, um, uh, and that's what we should be doing. Um, but I'm, I'm grateful to Dr. Gurley and Mr. Pitt at CHS and um, our, our K-12 social studies coordinator, all who are very supportive in teaching an inclusive, honest history of America. Um, We've had professional development sessions with Lorenzo and a local journalist, Jordy Yeager, who've put together Raised um, and many other um, documentaries, and they've done a lot of, of work uh, understanding local history, understanding all of the stories of local history, um, especially those in, in the African American community. Um, and so I, I feel very fortunate. Um, and this is one teacher's perspective at, at Charlottesville High School, but I don't feel like this larger public square conversation is, is 
impacting the way that I uh, structure curriculum or, 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 or teach. And Sally, you're in a private school, I am, so it's yeah, a little different. It is, and um, I was hired specifically to teach a kind of fuller, more accurate history, um, and so I have felt really free to do that. Um, but you know, as a parent, my kids go to Elmore High School, um, and you know, as a citizen, I'm very concerned about all of it. Um, and so, you know, I would hope that teachers and school boards would stand firm in teaching kind of the full history. Um, in Students want to know. So, like, I TA'd a couple classes at UVA a couple of years ago, and one of the things the students kept saying over and over was just, "Why wasn't I taught this in high school? Like, why didn't I know this?" And they want to know, and they're, you know, going to like look and find out. And you know, it's much better to like do it in a classroom environment where you can like really kind of understand the scope of it. Um. Great answers. Do we have Do we have any any update on Hashim? Do we think we, we have him? Okay. Um, just a little bit of a follow up. To we, we keep hearing that we have a lot of people who are not going into the teaching profession, or many people in the last uh, twelve months or so have been leaving teaching. Um, in some cases, specifically citing these culture wars or whatever in the workforce. Have you guys seen any evidence of this in your own schools or? Um, in other contexts then you want to comment on that? No, I, I haven't, um, but uh, that doesn't mean that uh, people aren't privately talking about it and, um, you know, there isn't that, that private pressure. I, you know, I don't know. Um, so, no, I haven't, no, I haven't felt it. I've only been teaching for two years, so <laughs> yeah. Um, is it okay, Tom, if I interject here? <laughs> I'm not on the panel, but but I will say I I work with teachers all across Virginia and all across the country, um, and the the experiences that these two excellent teachers are having um, is not the norm because I get calls from teachers literally all over the country almost every single day with really horrible tales of being told you can't you can't say these three words you can't say talk about these five topics um, so we, we may be in kind of a nice bubble here in Charlottesville in this area um, but even you know very close to this area I did a presentation right before this one started in one of the empty offices down the hall and I had teachers just two counties over expressing frustration over this. So it's, it's interesting how just in a very short, you know, one zip code away, you can have a very different experience. And, and I am sad that Ashim, um, who's in a different school division, isn't here to give, give us maybe yet another perspective, I hope. Um, just to, to yeah. add to that, I think that there are certainly frustrations that I hear, you know, in, in the hallways. And, and just frustrations, I think, in the, the larger culture, like I said about the history classroom being pulled into culture wars, and how um, some teachers feel like uh, there's a lack of trust. There's a lack of um, maybe a, a disconnect between what is actually going on in the classroom and what is being talked about going on in the classroom uh, by folks who are not, not there, not in the trenches doing the, the, the work, the, the day in, day out, lesson planning and, and grading. and. Um, educating ourselves about um, better, more complete ways to tell these stories. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that that frustration certainly could be contributing to the declining numbers of teachers in the workforce. I think, you know, if you back up and talk about the impact of the pandemic as well, where um, you, you have this like culture war thing mixed in with how difficult it was to teach during the pandemic. And that, that is a recipe for, for teachers, you know, considering other options. Um, what advice would you folks give other teachers who are struggling? Um, what are things that have worked for you being able to teach? Or how, how are you able to teach history so that every student sitting in your class sees themselves in that, that narrative? What are some tips you give beginning teachers or teachers who might be working in places where they aren't telling as, as 
much local history integrated into the larger story. Find your support group. Find teachers who are interested in in building this curriculum, in in working with oral histories and, and uh, local history, and want to partner with historical societies like this one. Find those teachers and help each other, um, because it, it's it's very alienating trying to do this alone. Um, so that would be my uh, my advice to a to a new teacher or someone who's finds you know starting out in this intimidating. I would say, you know, there's a way to teach history that isn't just like white people being bad, even though there obviously is a ton of that. I think that's part of like what's driving some of that feeling. Um, so like, you know, when we talk about Jefferson, he also had a neighbor, Edward Coles, who also inherited people and left Virginia. He moves to Illinois and frees all of his people and writes letters to both Madison and Jefferson telling them that they should free their people. Um, and so, you know, he was just a man of his time as Jefferson was. Um, and so, I, you know, I also spend, you know, several class periods talking about John Brown and like how great he was. And so there's a way to talk about histories of oppression and resistance in a way that can kind of sort of center everybody and give kids like models of you know how to handle the world that they're growing up and coming into. And I, I'm gonna um, embarrass two more people in the audience other than Matt's parents, Jacqueline <coughs> and Laura Cooper, my friends from Monticello. Um, when I first moved to Charlottesville, I'd been teaching in Richmond. Um, Jacqueline was new at Monticello, uh, and she and Laura immediately adopted me and helped me figure out how would we get these local <coughs> histories in. Um, Tom and Sterling, towards the end of my time in the city schools, like they were willing to open up and start letting these artifacts come out into the light and um, inviting us in when we started New American History. So I can't express enough, like support your local historical societies. You're doing that by being here tonight, so you sort of already drank the Kool-Aid, but museums and historic sites are so important. And the other part of this culture war and this SOL fight that we're sort of struggling with here in Virginia and our friends in Florida and you know, Texas and other places. Um, Place-based learning is really, really important. And our, our museums and our cultural institutions, uh, the ferry, you know, if we had let that just go away and, and not be available for children and communities to experience, that would have been such a shame. And so people like Laura and Jacqueline working with people like Matt and Sally and Hashim, um, that is just so important. And we've defunded field trips. I don't even like to call them that anymore. I try and put in field experience. And we'll just stop using that word field trip, like have a true field experience like Jacqueline helped me set up, um, like Matt set up with his students to go up to Rutgersville to meet those veterans in person and experience that. Um, that's something that's worth our money. So please help continue to support those. I'll get off my soapbox. Um, our last question, and this is for both of you as well. Um, what questions have you, we not asked you tonight or what question do you wish the parents and community members would ask you specifically about history education? I think um, just to kind of go back to the, the previous question too and like what what do historians do and historians look at source documents and they ask questions about them so having uh, it's important that students ask questions and mm -hmm continually ask questions. I, we just did an exercise today in, in school uh, where they were only asking questions. They had five minutes to just go and ask each other questions and write the questions down and then prioritize the questions, but good questions are better than an answer because they, they snowball and there are more questions. Um, and along those lines, um, when we're dealing with, with topics, we have to ask questions from as many perspectives as possible. I used to be a journalist, and, and that's, that's the goal, is to, is to not just have two sources maybe, but have as many perspectives as possible. And when you're dealing with a topic like the American Revolution, like what were free white women thinking? What were um, white men who didn't own land thinking? What were enslaved people thinking? What were indigenous people thinking? Um, so to have as many different questions and as many different perspectives as possible is the way to 
I think, have the most inclusive history. If you're just looking at um, like the people who have left the most sources, um, you're going to have a pretty narrow view of, of history, right? Um, so it's, and I think that's why oral histories are important too, to, to add to that catalog of story. Um, I just wanted to add that, I was thinking about that. Um, I'm going to take Hashim, I know that we were, we were talking about um, this through email, and one of his question was, ask teachers why they teach, why they got into this profession. Um, I think that disarms the, the cultural war conversation about like hard history and, and like critical race theory. I think, why did you teach? What, what interests you about history? Um, I think that that is a way that um, we can have a, a conversation that, that's civil. <laughs> Sally. Uh, maybe not ask, but <laughs> good say. Uh, I guess I wish you know people knew like how many resources there are out there to learn and teach with, and you know, you know, for parents whose kids are learning a different history than like you know what I learned in school, it can feel intimidating or threatening, um, and you know, and you know, teachers having to like you know learn some of this stuff too, you know, it is a lot. Um, but there's, you know, there's a lot of podcasts and videos now on YouTube that are just actually really well done and kind of tell a full history. There's, you know, this really cool book series called Revisioning America, and they're like pretty short, accessible books that just tell, you know, in different ways, like a really inclusive history. Um, those have been helpful to me to kind of use as a guide and just, you know, there are resources out there that kind of make learning all this and talking about this a lot easier. We've run out of questions. Tom, do we have a, a little time if the audience wants to ask our panelists a question or two? Definitely. Is that okay with you guys? Questions in the audience? Matt's trying to break our microphone. And I, just so, so you know, we have our in. friends on Facebook. So if you ask a question, I'm going to repeat it before our teacher panels uh, respond so the Facebook people can hear your questions. So there's someone over here. Yes, the gentleman in the blue shirt. Yeah, I, uh, both my daughters went to Charleston High in the 90s. And when my oldest graduated, I remember having a dinner, uh, dinner table conversation. She was getting ready to go off to college, and the question came up, who was president of the United States during World War II? Uh, and I asked it facetiously, but she didn't know the answer. And so I sort of got a little riled up about that. And I said, but you took American history at Charleston High. And she said, well, we stopped at World War I because we ran out of time. <laughs> yeah. And I always remember that, that you're teaching a subject that just keeps growing and growing and growing, and yet your number of days in school year stays the same. That's true. So what's the process that you go through to decide what gets added on as our history keeps growing? Who, d who edits out? Who makes those changes? Other, other than the state legislature, I don't want to hear about them. <laughs> okay, so that just to repeat the question for the Facebook friends out there, um, the question is, as you know, history continues on, we keep adding more content. His daughter said we never got past World War One, so I really don't know what happened after World War Two. So he's asking his teachers, you know, what is the process? We're not adding any extra days to the school year, or extra hours. So how do you fit it all in, or how do you decide? What's important? It's a it's a great question. Um, I think that you you kind of made a comment about state legislators, and I know you want to, don't you don't want to hear that, but at a public high school in Virginia, that is that that's a part of of the equation, right? We have standards, and the standards are decided on by a committee, and then they are given to us teachers, and we have to make sense of that. But you're right. Can you can you teach? You have to be your own individual, and you have to decide how you're going to frame this, what you're going to include, and th the best way, I think, to, to frame all of this information is through really interesting, compelling, guiding questions. Um, you know, what does it mean to be patriotic? Um, can protest be patriotic? Um, you know, some of, some of these questions, like, how should we remember war? Um, and I think you can tie um, content to these big questions in a way that engages students and in a way that kind of attaches on the facts so that maybe um, 
so that those U.S. presidents could become more memorable <laughs> for, for students, <laughs> or they will be more inspired to want to learn uh, uh, along the way. But I think that's that's a way to do it. Um, you're right, Bill. History keeps getting, keep having more history. <laughs> <laughs> Sally, you aren't bound by those same restraints of the state curriculum. So yeah, how do you approach it? Because history does keep getting bigger. We keep there's getting still bigger. only so many days <laughs> in the school year. Um, my kind of end point is uh, helping the students kind of understand how Charlottesville got to be how it is. Um, and, you know, the issues facing Charlottesville are the same issues facing, you know, most people in most cities across the country. Um, and so the issues of kind of land and labor are kind of the big ones that I try and thread through. And then also just like really important stuff has happened here that also like is, you know, national. And so um, we spend, you know, some time talking about Carrie Buck and eugenics, which, you know, a lot of it took place at UVA. And so like, I think that's an important thing for them to know um and you know you know when we come to like world war ii like we had a um prisoner of war camp in crozet and so kind of trying to find as many kind of like you know typical history stories that also kind of intersect um but a lot of the stuff kind of really comes down to like how we use land and how we kind of got to where we are now Great. Do we have other questions? Yes, the young lady in the far back. You're going to have to really project your voice for us. <laughs> Use your Hi, teacher everybody. voice. My name is Channing. Um, I'm a professor at UVA. Thank you all to the panelists for um, talking about your classrooms. And so one of the things that I'm, I'm curious about is how are your students kind of reacting to all these political and cultural conversations around CRT? And do they have um, do they have room to kind of unpack this a little bit in your classes? like in the context of some of the things you're teaching, because there's a lot of, you know, conversation happening both at home, among them, on TV, all of this stuff. Is that, is there space for them to help unpack some of that in your classroom, given some of the topics you're talking about? And just in case Facebook folks couldn't hear, even though you did a lovely job protecting your voice, because you do have a professor voice, um, the question was, um, how are the students in your classes is there a way that you're able to discuss these quote unquote culture wars or the um, CRT rhetoric or that sort of thing? Um, are you able to have discussions or kids asking about it since it's in the news a lot, even though you said it's not impacting your ability to teach as much at your particular schools? How is that being discussed by the students? I haven't had many direct conversations with students about critical race theory, um, but we, we have hard conversations about race and um, and I of course allow space for, I think that's so important like if even if it's a tangent like it, it, that that's where the teachable moments are like because that's like a raw question that a student has and you have to capitalize on that because um, you know those those moments you know can be rare so to yes it's important to leave space for these organic questions that come up and, and maybe then uh, the next lesson, like make it a centerpiece of your lesson because it, it, it sparked so much uh, uh, discussion. Um, so, yes, we need to leave space for it. Sally? Yeah, that's the thing too is, yeah, that the, the kids are aware of all of this stuff, even if it doesn't impact us. And, um, and yeah, like they will you know, just toss out questions that they have. Um, uh, some students have talked about either talking to the parents or grandparents about some of the stuff and like that there's resistance there. Um, and so kind of helping them, you know, navigate that. And just kind of framing it in a way that helps them understand why there is some of this pushback. Um, we're getting ready to start next week a uh, three to four week unit on reconstruction and I like slowed it down because there's so much that's like you know current today and that like relates to it and so giving them space to like really think about you know how history like the legacies of it really still matter today. Yes ma'am the purple and then we'll do the gentleman the brown hat. 
I'm a former social studies middle school teacher in the Orange County system and was very uh, lucky to have a system and structure that did not impose any restrictions on us. But with that and listening to your comments about what is told and what is not told about our American history, I grew up in the 50s in Oklahoma and took <laughs> Oklahoma history. And it wasn't until 10 years ago that I learned about Greenwood and Tulsa. Okay. And I think about had that story been told in our state history during that time of pre-integration, how would it have impacted my understanding, my peers and so forth as we move forward into integration and understanding racial issues. But it wasn't taught. And when I learned the story, I was so horrified. And then I got to thinking, how would I teach that story to my students in the classroom today? So I have great respect for what you all are doing and how you are doing it. So, Tom, mm -hmm. did you, yeah. Thank you. They can hear that fine. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So the question was, these stories, you know, here's a great example, a history educator who didn't know about Tulsa and she grew up in that, that state. So what are, what are your thoughts on the, um, those stories and how they're coming out now and there's these whole generations of parents and grandparents that were unaware? What are, what, where are you finding good materials to tell those stories in your classrooms or how might we tell those stories? Just to talk about it broadly before, um, and going to the specifics, Tom mentioned a, a quote from Ed Ayers I actually wrote down, revising history with truth. So making the story more complete by including Tulsa. I never learned that in New Jersey public schools. I love New Jersey public schools. We never talked about um, Tulsa. Um, so I think it's, it's important as an educator to continue to learn about all of these stories and to seek out as many different sources as possible so that we can then relay them to students and then they have a fuller picture than I did when I was taught uh, history. Um, I just think that's, it's, it's so important, revising history with truth. I think it helps to like, you know, most stuff there's a pattern and so like showing the pattern helps them, you know, it's like, we talk a lot in Charlottesville about Vinegar Hill and the destruction of that and how awful that was, but like that's not the first time the city takes land from people. And so just even like a small example of um, the synagogue was originally where the central library is now, I think. Um, and the state wanted the land to put a post office, even though like there's lots of land they could have used. And so we talked about like you know, government can just come in and take your property and then what do you do? And so just kind of building in a pattern so that when you get to like really hard stuff, they can like see, you know, how this happens. Okay, my friend in the brown cap. <laughs> um, just dovetailing off of her question, uh, closer to home, um, you know, how many people were taught about Lumpkin's Jail in Virginia history? You know, about uh, 200 to 400,000 people being sold and shipped downstream in Richmond, not far from here. Um, it wasn't taught. And, uh, and many people still don't know about it. And it's hard, hard to believe that, but you know, in 2023 that that's the story. Um, kind of close, uh, closer to uh, what the question that I was going to ask is about first uh, history being taught from uh, original source. And, and you mentioned the vet Veterans History Project, and that's a, that's a great example of being able to get to veterans history. But there are many pieces of history that are hard to get to from first source. Uh, you mentioned the Monacans in, in, our, in our world here in Albemarle County. How do you teach about history of Monacan uh, uh, Native Americans? Uh, how, what source documents do you bring into your classroom to help us learn about indigenous people in this area? Uh, a lot of work. There's actually a really great book that this guy, I think at UVA, Jeffrey Hantman, did with Karen Wood um, about kind of compiling all the information they could find on Monacans. Um, and so I read that and um, basically excerpted stuff for the students to read. I like 
pretty old school and we'll do like lecture slides um, that they take notes from and so I put a lot of that in um, but her you know YouTube video was um, great but yeah it's it is really hard um, I have used the UVA archives a lot there's actually this really great file that they have um, out on Barracks Road you know in the Revolutionary War we had um, Hessian soldiers stationed here um, and in the 70s they did like an archaeological dig because they did the development back there and there's a cemetery there and so somebody compiled all of this stuff into a file that's in UVA um, and so I went and like scanned all of that in and one of the projects we do is we go through the file and look at the archaeological photos and stuff and like they're you know they have to decide like would you have developed this land knowing there's a cemetery here and all of this stuff um, it it is really difficult to teach local history because there is no textbook and so it's it is very time consuming okay blue shirt and then we'll take as many more as we can after that i don't know how much longer tom we have this space but the gentleman in the blue and white well, at Check first, I was going to ask if we could come back a year later to see if the legislature's changed. <laughs> I will. I will be here in a year if Tom will let us. I would love to do that. The, the thought is occurring to me. Listen to the story about Tulsa, and I never learned that. Growing, I'm yeah. from Texas, and we never learned anything about that. But it, it occurs to me, my parents didn't complain about what was being taught then. I didn't complain about what. Maybe it's because we weren't told the truth. And you said we have to speak from truth. Is it now that we are telling the truth? Is that what's causing a problem? I, I'm just curious if we go more toward the truth, is that going to cause more problems? Yes. Sure. <laughs> cause more problems. Um, I, we can't control how people react. We can control how, uh, how we teach complete honest stories and I think that's where we have that's can be our North Star I, I don't think we you know their politicians are going to react and do their thing and um, it, it, I ho hope in the classroom we, we stay true to you know what historians do and don't get too dragged into the cultural wars because that's I don't think that's good for the study of history um, so I, I hope that answers your question well, that's close. I am destroying the ears. Oh, I'm destroying the ears of everyone on Facebook. So, did you want to add anything to that before we destroy the microphone? I will say, I'm, I will say, we, you know, you mentioned Ed's quote at the beginning, Tom, and that's the whole reason that he started New American History is these are free resources that any teacher in America can use. And Matt has worked with us a little bit in the summer. We've actually hired Matt because he's one of my you know, star teachers that I worked with. Um, but we've hired teachers all across the country to tell the story of Tulsa, to talk about Lumpkins Jail. And we've worked with people like Laurenette Lilly at University of Richmond who have you know, been trying to get that story out there and save that from just being a parking lot. Um, and so we are working with local historical societies and teachers um, to make sure that we're not only telling the stories that we all didn't learn as kids, um, but also that we are encouraging schools to go to those spaces like Monticello and Montpelier where those stories happened um, and to go to Lumpkins Jail and to take a walking tour like Tom and Sterling have helped lead around our city so kids can learn the local history, Sally's kids and Matt's kids. So um, it is, it is, a year from now it might be too late. We really need to be looking at what is going on in Richmond and it's actually February 2nd is when the next round of arguing over these standards and if you feel strongly about everything we've discussed tonight, you know, write a letter or show up at that meeting. There's going to be public comment. Um, that, that, that would be my best advice. You know, we have to all own this because it's all of our kids and grandkids and nieces and nephews and um, future people that are going to take care of all of us when someone else to start taking care of us, you know, as we get older. So I, I am hopeful that we will not go backwards, that we will continue to teach these stories and get them all out there. Um, okay. I have one question. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you for all being educators. Um, I think in this day and age, it's probably as challenging as anybody has ever been up against if anybody's paying any attention and i hear about it i've got a first grade teacher in the city here at jackson by i've got a 10th grade teacher at monticello high school um, and i've got a human rights lawyer 
daughter in London who can <laughs> tell you some horrific stories if you think our stories of slavery and indigenous people and so forth and so on are, are major. Um, so I no. applaud and commend you and um, I, I'm, I'm at 68 years of age, race and history are my hot buttons, so you'll have to forgive me if I get a little fired up. But one of the things I wanted to ask you is, do you feel inhibited by parental pressure or by administrative pressure? Do you feel inhibited in feeling like you may be crossing the line on CRT in particular, which was a well-played subject by our current governor to <laughs> become the governor, and I'll leave my politics out of it after <laughs> saying that, but I didn't get that. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> Don't get me going. But um, do you feel an intimidation factor has your principal or your supervisory or someone in your block come to you and said, hey, Matt, you got to ease up on this true history stuff. You know, <laughs> you're going to hurt somebody's feelings here pretty soon. No, true. No, I, I, I feel fortunate that no, no one has come to me and had, you know, a, a conversation. You need to change the way that you're teaching this. Um, I, I do think what, what might limit me is not that what, what anyone from the outside is doing, but from my perspective. I mean, I'm a white male teacher sure. teaching at a very diverse public high school. And so I have to constantly check in with myself as to how I'm teaching this as well. I mean, uh, you know, being reflective about that is, I think, really important. An important part of being a teacher is to constantly be reflective. Um, that's another thing I would, uh, you know, advice I would give to, to teachers who, you know, kind of are struggling with, with how to teach this is to just, you know, be honest but also be reflective and, and also talk with your students about it. It's a partnership. It's what, what, did, what did they want to know about this? Um, <clears throat> I think there was a question about leaving space for them earlier. Like, that's, that's where this comes into play. Thank you. Yeah. Oh. Way in the back, the gentleman with the gray, yeah. Oh. I just find it so dynamic with history. We're, we're, we're feel, my wife and I are fairly new to the area, but uh, about a month or two ago, we went to the Paramount and saw the documentary called The Levies, the Levies at Monticello, which I found absolutely fascinating. And I never knew any of that. And I, I found it sad, too, in a way, since they were never given the, their due until maybe 20 years ago, as recently as 20 years ago. And you probably are aware, being from Charlottesville, we live in the reserve, and behind the reserve, there's an area where there's a new development, but there are several signs of indicating that at one time, that was a large African-American area where a lot of freedmen lived, uh, starting from the Revolutionary War, and I think it probably ended in Reconstruction. And I don't know if you're aware of that, like you guys are aware of that, you guys are teachers in the area, if that's something that you've been able to convey to your students, because I find that very interesting. You're talking about Ivy Creek? Right behind, yeah, right behind. Yeah. Free State Road. Free State Road. Yeah, Free State Road. Also, thank you. Well, this okay. building was yeah. is on what used to be Free State, so yeah. yeah. And there was actually three cemeteries there too. Yes. And there's another cemetery and where the Aurora Plantation was too, which is still active, by the way. Yeah. That's where I think people like Tom and Sterling are so important, and Andrea Douglas at the Jefferson School. Um, Andrea worked with us in the city schools and the Albemarle schools and some of the private schools for the last, how many summers, Matt? Four or five summers. Right. Um, she and Jelaine Schmidt and others have worked to provide local history um, content to supplement the state curriculum. And every summer they spend an entire week, it, you know, the first year was face to face and then we were on Zoom for a couple of years and this summer we were back kind of a hybrid model. Um, but they bring in People, you know, some of the people that you guys have interviewed for oral histories, um, Lorenzo's, uh, some of his films have been featured in there, and I can't tell you how invaluable that was to me as a curriculum specialist, um, working with the whole gamut K through 12. Um, so uh, that's another space, the Jefferson School, that does incredible work, that's been telling the story of Vinegar Hill. They're featured in Lorenzo's most current film, Rays with Jordy, um, but they also spent a lot of time working 
tirelessly with K-12 teachers to, to make sure that we have access to those. They've let me use them in our No American History research. They've, they've let, you know, <laughs> teachers, that, it started off as just going to be Charlottesville and Albemarle, but then the surrounding areas like Louisa and Madison and Orange were like, no, we want to come too. Nobody's talking about this in our county. And so now we've had seven or eight counties um, worth of teachers coming to these institutes in the summer. And that, that's really important. So to add on to that, I know that Lorenzo Dickerson and Jordy Yeager, both local journalists, are currently working with our 11th grade English team. Mm -hmm. They're reading Raisin in the Sun, mm -hmm. and they are partnering with Jordy's Mapping Seaville project to talk about housing issues in Charlottesville and redlining and um, you know, issues of that nature. And so um, uh, just to shout out Jordy and, and Lorenzo for, for their work, and they're very willing to work with our young people, and they're very good at it, uh, which is, you know, not always the case if you don't have the experience and the training, but it's it's great to be in a community that has these types of resources and the willingness to to help out um, you know teenagers in that way. Uh, the blue and then the blue. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question about history in real time. Um, if you were teaching then, how did you handle your classroom the day after the United Bikes rally and after the Capitol insurrection? The question was um, history in real time, like addressing current events. How do we handle Unite the Right? Because school started like what two days after that, three days after, and um, yeah. and then after January six. How did you both handle that in your classroom? I think with. Unite the Right, I had to check in with myself to first, just like how, how I was uh, doing with, with all of that. Um, school, it, we were in um, pre-week. We hadn't started school yet. Um, but Unite the Right, the, the capital insurrection, you need to talk about it with students because they're talking about it with their friends and their family, so let's talk about it in the classroom. I mean, you, you can't like shy away from it when that's happening. I mean, I'm I have a journalist background, so I'm kind of gravitate towards current events naturally. Um, but harness the energy that students have, the questions they have, and try to, to navigate that the best that you can. Um, but encourage it uh, for sure, and, and try to connect them with sources and with perspectives that are credible and 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 and, and varied, uh, but but credible. <laughs> Um, yeah, I wasn't word. teaching yet word. when United Right happened, um, but I was there, and you know, last year my students asked if we were you know, going to get to it, and I was like, yeah. Um, and so we you know, just do it at the end of the year when it's you know, chronological, and I just showed my photos and videos I have. Um, the same with you know January 6th, but also, you know keeping with the patterns and stuff because I know that I'm going to be teaching that at the end, kind of, you know, we, um, you know, look at, you know, the KKK during Reconstruction, we look at it, you know, especially with like eugenics and stuff in the 1920s, and so, again, they can like see this pattern of, you know, white supremacy coming around so that it, you know, makes sense because nothing that happens now just comes out of nowhere, like there's always a history. Um, this year I'm doing something a little new and at the end of Reconstruction we're going to watch about a half hour of Birth of a Nation and they're going to, you know, there's a title thing like halfway through the movie that's like this is the historical re representation of Reconstruction and so they're going to like write a movie review of it and answer the question, is this a historical representation using what they've learned about Reconstruction? And so, you know, I think hopefully that will be helpful especially getting to like January 6th and stuff and they'll be able to see you know a lot of similarities just to piggyback off of that just uh, Sally you're talking about like adding historical context to a current event so that you kind of get a little more detached from the emotion of the event and add that context I think like today we get our information in spurts online right we get fragments of information so for the history teacher to be able to contextualize um, and maybe you know go back 10 years, go back 100 years, I think that's a value add for students who are in just this, like, this knee-jerk like, information consumption mode where it's hard for them to see the larger context. It's hard, it's hard for all of us to see the larger context, but for, for teenagers especially. And I will say that 
because I was still working with Matt at the time when the Unite the Right rally happened, and Andrea Douglas and several folks at UVA, your colleagues at UVA, um, uh, Lewis Nelson came and spent a few days at Buford with us. Um, and, and every year after that, you know, that's towards the beginning of the school year, even Susan Bro, who was a former teacher, Heather's mom came, um, people who went on that Seville pilgrimage trip. We had students, we had teachers in our school divisions, um, both Albemarle, Charlottesville, and private schools. We had students from our schools who went on those trips with Andrea and Jelaine um, and others. Uh, and then they came back and shared what they learned. And many of them, the older members of the community who went on that trip, came back, like you said, and said, I never learned this stuff. But now that I've gone and traveled to where these, you know, again, these historic sites, it's powerful taking people to the place where these events happened. Um, they came back with a whole new understanding of history, and then they were so gracious to come into our schools and share that with the students. And I've, I've had kids, and I, don't, I haven't worked in, the city schools for four years since I went to U of R. I still have kids come to me in the grocery store or if I'm out, you know, walking on the downtown mall and they'll be like, oh, you're that map lady that used to come in our class. Remember when those people came and talked to us and they still remember that it was such a powerful experience or they remember going to Monticello with us in third or fourth grade and now they're, you know, first year students at UVA. Oh. And they still remember that because those stories matter to them and they do not remember anything on a multiple choice test that we forced them to take. I can tell you that right now, they, they do not. Maybe that's how I end my uh, discussion, but I don't know how many more questions we can take. Um, but, but I will say those, those real experiences, talking to people, the oral histories, bringing those veterans in, bringing those people who were on that trip in, bringing in our friends from UVA, Monticello, um, those are the richest experiences and those are the things that we can't let these state standards cut, cut all those opportunities out. We just can't. Okay. Wow. Well, I want to thank our panel. Thank you very much. I know these are not easy questions to talk about, particularly maybe when your mom's in the audience and, uh, or maybe your, your boss might be in the audience too, I don't know. Um, I'm sorry Ashim could not make it tonight. Uh, we'll have to catch up with him and make sure he's all right. Um, but it gives us a reason to have another program. Um, I wanted to answer really quickly the gentleman talking about the reserve and the Laura and Free State. Um, like has been mentioned already, there is a treasure trove of local history information and also people. There's a Central Virginia History Researchers, uh, which they, they have a website you can look at. Um, it's a group of local folks who do a lot of this type of research. Um, and I've been connected with and work closely with the city and the county planning and zoning and historic preservation offices. So, um, And I've fielded a number of questions about Dunlora recently in terms of its sale and possible developments so and then also have ties with the local archaeology community too so there's a lot of ways in which we can work to understand history you know progress and development and so on and so forth but in terms of making sure that it's preserved oh and, and Cvilpedia thank you Dan my board member um, you know that's another online resource in terms of it's a user-based um, crowdsourced type of um, information platform been around for almost 15, 20 years, um, and it's one of the largest local wikis in the world. Mm -hmm. um, and it's right here in Charlottesville. Um, and Seville with a Seville, Sevillepedia. Nope. Right. Sevillepedia. Yep. And if you ever do a local like Google search for anything local, you might actually pop up in your feed. Um, one thing that struck me in terms of listening to everything here, and one thing that struck me when I was following along with the Board of Supervisors conversations about the At Ready statue. Um, and when they had the final vote about removal of the monument that was in front of the courthouse, each of the supervisors to a person basically said, I never learned this when I was in school. So maybe you know our goal in terms of having a truthful understanding of our past is to have the next generation not have that excuse. Mm -hmm. To be able to say, if, even if I didn't learn it in school, at least I was given the tools to figure it out. So That's good. I want to thank my panelists. I want to thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, if we get to any Facebook questions, we'll post some answers online. But uh, 
in these hybrid situations, sometimes one group takes over the other, so <laughs> that's fine with us. But thank you all. We're at the witching hour almost, and uh, have a great evening. Okay, thank you. Thank you.